man, does it feel good to be back. All right, guys, this is the video that I've been talking about for a while. I'm going to show you how it is that I color correct and grade C-Log from the Canon EOS R. I'm going to show you the entire process. And at the end, I'm going to then also share a link where you can download these LUTs. So in the LUT pack, what can you expect? You're going to get Canon EOS R C-Log 8-bit, right, from the camera, two Rec. 709 low contrast, medium contrast, high contrast, teal and orange look, two-tone look, and Alexa look-alike. That's what's included in the pack. Now, a couple of housekeeping notes. One, the video is not short. So if you can't handle it, you may miss out on some really important information. Two, the LUTs that I'm making available for download cost $1. And that's because of the platform that I'm using to deliver the LUTs. Now, once I sort out how it is that I could add a coupon code so that you can get the LUTs for free, I'm going to be releasing that on my other social media platforms. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. If you're following, you may be able to get those LUTs free of charge. But the most valuable part, right? You've heard of teach people how to fish instead of handing them the fish. That's what I'm intending to do with this video, because I think that the value of learning in a way that will allow you to do whatever you need, whenever you need it, is way more valuable than taking somebody else's LUTs, throwing it out to your footage, because this allows you to grow as a creative, as a professional, and as a content creator for yourself or other brands. And that's the purpose and the reason for this video. So with that, let's jump on in to Resolve and let's start going through the process. Okay, so we're going to go over how it is that I grade C-Log. So here are my clips and I can show all the clips that I have in there, but I'm gonna hide them just so that we have more real estate and we can look at the waveform and how the waveform appears to be. And you can see it is compressed highlights are not blown, shadows are not crushed. The reason why I'm making this video is because if we try to use one of the LUTs that's in here, for example, I'll use the 1D LUT because that's this is an 8-bit file because it was recorded straight into the camera. So if I try to go 1D Canon Log to Rec. 709, it destroys the image. This is way blown out, really bad highlights around Bert's face there's zero information on uh, Sophie's back here. So this is clearly not working. If I try using LUTs, like the other Canon LUTs, the ones that we've all downloaded, and I try doing, you know, a 1D LUT, full to full, Canon log, these, these are 10-bit, 12-bit, and 16-bit. So this is already not going to be the correct LUT because Internally, it's only capturing that 8-bit. And this is what happens when we select it and why it is that things get way blown out. Okay, so before we go on, I'm going to interrupt for just a quick moment and say it is very important that the exposure adjustment is made even after you apply the LUTs. So say you download the LUTs and you go ahead and you slap on the Alexa look or the low contrast look or the orange and teal look to your own footage, you will have to make some exposure adjustments to make sure that the skin tones are at the correct IRE values, the highlights are not clipped, and that the shadows are not crushed. So let's get back to the tutorial. The first thing I need to do is I'm gonna add a node. And you can think of these nodes as layers in Photoshop, right? So I'm gonna leave the first one um, alone in other words, apply no correction or change on it. And the reason why I like to leave one empty is because if I need to apply noise reduction, I want to apply noise reduction before any of my color changes or any of my information changes to preserve the quality and then get the cleanest possible image in the end. The first thing that I do is I'd like to essentially set my exposure. 
if anyone doesn't know how to read the waveform, basically it's the amount of light values based on an image from left to right. So here's left to right and what those values are. So this spike right here where we see where it's almost going to 896 um, IRE is actually this corner of the computer. So here we go. I want to make sure that I expand again the highlights and lower some of the some of the dark areas to give it the correct contrast. So I'm going to start with lift, which are the shadows, right, or the dark areas, and I'm going to bring them down. Now, looking at my scene here, I know that this chair is black. That is the darkest area. I know that this glass top on this desk is black. I can see that the darkest area are the shadows inside of Bert's hair. These are brown. This is a really, really dark blue in the painting in the back. So that is how I'm going to set my exposure. Do I have anything that is absolutely black as in it needs to be crushed? And the answer is no. So my waveform, I'm going to bring it all the way to zero and then I'm going to back it off one. <clears throat> because this gives me an accurate representation of the darkest areas in my image. Then I'm going to go over to the gain and I'm going to do the opposite. So again, I like to go as high as I can and then bring it down sometimes two or one. This looks already pretty good to me. Now, we started to lose some detail in Bert's skin and definitely some detail on the back of Sophie's um, neck here. So to make that adjustment, we're going to use the gamma and we're going to lower the gamma so that in the waveform, we can bring back Bert's value, right? Her skin tone value here, back down to 768. And basically, I'm going to make adjustments until I can still see detail in my scene in all the highlight areas, and I can, and I'm not crushing any of the blacks. But it looks like I can come down on my blacks. Nope. All right. Let's see. So this is where we started and this is where we ended up once I'm satisfied with the contrast. Because I'm not a professional colorist, I like to make every single one of my adjustments in its own node, as in adding a different layer to make changes to my actual video. And the reason for it is that I can go back and change any one value without affecting others. Now I'll explain this here a little bit more in a second, but let's add a node. Okay, the very next thing that I want to address is going to be my white balance. I want to make sure that I am balanced. I'm accurately representing what it is that I'm seeing in my eye using scopes. So I like to use the parade because this gives me an idea as to where I'm at in terms of balance for my image. Now, there are many different ways that people make this adjustment. I happen to like making the adjustment using um, the primary bars, which is this section here. But Resolve actually makes it super easy with the auto white balance picker. So you can set the white balance with this white balance picker and I can pick I know she's white, so that instantly made my white balance adjustment. All right, so when I did the auto white balance, it's very subtle, but you can see it cleans up some of that warmth that was in the whites. So you may or may not need to, depending on what it is that you're doing, but this brings us closer. The parade didn't change much. Obviously we have, um, skin tones 
This is a warm wall color. So that's why the red appears to be slightly elevated um, over the blue. And, and this shot was also taken during golden hour, which changes the white balance. But clearly the keyboard is white, which it is on this iMac. And then also Sophie is white and she looks white. So we're good. Now my next adjustment, I'm gonna add another note again. And in this adjustment, I want to now address the saturation. So to make saturation adjustments, I like to use the vector scope because this gives me a representation of where my color is, right? In other words, how saturated something is or isn't. And let's see. Okay, so to keep it within Rec. 709 standards, essentially draw a circle around these targets, right? So red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta. And the trace, which is this little spot thing that shows up in the middle, that's called the trace, needs to stay restrained within the circle in order to keep the legal limit of saturation for broadcast or Rec. 709 standard. What I like to do is I like to have my saturation go up two thirds of the way into this circle to give me good, brilliant, vibrant colors, okay? That's what I like to do. Obviously, different people in different scenes are going to call for different things. So just keep that in mind. All right, so the way that I like to adjust saturation is by going to the RGB mixer. So RGB is red, green, blue, right? And what I like to do is I like to increase each of these channels all the way to 100%. And the reason why I'm increasing all the way to 100% is because this will ensure that every single pixel down to the pixel, if it's got a red value, it goes to 100%. If it's got a green or blue, it goes to 100%. There is no cross-contamination of color when you do this because whatever the color value is for that pixel is increased on its own. Now, obviously, this does not look terrific. So the next step is to go into this tool, which is the key in Resolve, right? So we have curves, we have a lot of different things here, but you go into the key, and then what I like to do is, where it says key output, I like to drop that down. And what I do is, instead of looking at the image as I'm dropping it down, I'm looking at the trace. And if you remember, I said I like to be about two thirds. So I begin to drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. And then I just make some fine tune adjustments here. And now let's see what that looked like before. There's the before shot. And then there is the saturated or saturated shot. So to me, big difference. Skin looks alive, looks healthy, you know, really nice. The greens are not way blown out of proportion. And this shot looks fairly balanced to me. Okay, this little area on the desk in the bottom looks a little oversaturated, so I'm gonna drop it down a little bit more. Maybe we'll go with 500. Let's see. Yeah, so that is the beauty of working with Resolve. Essentially, any one of these corrections, if you want to mix it back in with the original, you just go to the key and then you reduce the key output. It's also a good idea when you are keying anything to blur the edges. So I like to blur the edges by about 250.250. And 
that makes sure that there are no hard edges as the key is on or off. And so this is just a good practice. Okay, so we're almost done. This looks a lot better than when we started and we haven't lost any detail. We can still see the tonality and the skin tones and we're seeing a lot more of the room essentially come to life, right? Okay, so now time for another node. When you're capturing a C-log, there is no sharpness. They just, there, there is no sharpness or no sharpness is applied, I should say, in the image processing when you're capturing a C-log. So to fix that, I set up a new node and I'm going to go to this tool, which is my blur tool. So I know sharpness, blur, but this is what we're trying to do here. So on this little dropdown, you have three options. You have blur, you have sharpen, and you have mist. Each one of these works slightly different and yet they're all the same. <laughs> and I'll, I'll explain here what I mean. So I'm gonna select mist. And what mist allows me to do is it allows me to keep areas that are not in focus or part of my point of interest slightly unsharpened. But fine detail areas like eyebrows, eyes, lips, nose, um, hair, it allows me to sharpen those areas. And that's what mist allows me to do. If you go up, it blurs. This is why I said they all kind of work similar. To reset, you just click this little um, circle arrow things and it resets it. If you go down, it will sharpen. And you can see how the HV ratio affects the radius of the sharpening. All right, so sharpening is one of those things where everybody has their own idea of how sharp something should be. And in my opinion, to keep it cinematic, it needs to be sharp, but in, it doesn't need to be digital sharp. So with that, again, I'm selecting mist, and then I'm going to bring this down to 47 value. I generally don't go beyond 47, but as you can see, we increase the sharpening around all of the key areas that are in focus, that should be in focus, and we allowed everything else to remain essentially kind of soft because it's supposed to be soft. We add another node, and this time, what I want to do is I want to make sure that if something should not be saturated, that there is no saturation. In other words, I'm cleaning up the shadows. Okay, so to clean up my blacks, I'm going to select something that I think is, is black that should not have saturation. And I'm gonna to try to get rid of the reflections associated to that color. So any color cast that may be happening in there. And to do that here in my scene, I can very clearly see the Apple logo looks like it's got a color cast. Again, golden hour, reflections from the warm walls and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna select the apple and then I get these three points added to my curve. So I'm gonna count one, two, three, four. And I can see four different um, lines after the first line, which is the value, the highlight value of this dark logo. So I'm going to reset it and I'm gonna go one, two, three, four. I'm gonna pin a spot there and then I'm going to bring the dark values all the way down. And that cleaned up this Apple logo quite a bit from added color cast. So let's see before. It's subtle, but it makes a difference. Of course, if you want to be more aggressive with it, you certainly can. And if you feel you went overboard, then all you have to do is go back to the key and then essentially 
dial it back. And I'm going to dial it back to 0.7. And that is one way that you can keep all of your shadows nice and clean. Okay, so now that we have all of the basic corrections, then to make it a little bit more cinematic, I am going to add some color contrast. And the way that I like to add color contrast is by adding a node And then instead of selecting the primary wheels, I like using the log wheels. And the log wheels are super fine adjustments essentially into each of these different areas. So I'm gonna look at my trace to make sure that I'm not overdoing it. And what I like to do is I like to go right and then down and just be subtle with it. And I can already see the the color shift or the contrast happening. Then I'm going to do the same thing with my midtones, but I'm going to go opposite. I'm going to go up and left. And that is before, this is after. So it's very subtle, but it looks a lot more cinematic. If I think I went a little too far, then I just, again, from the key, I just dial that back a bit. I'm going to dial that back to about 800. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, how it is that I grade C log from the Canon EOS R. So, in the LUT pack, what can you expect? You're going to get Canon EOS R C log 8 bit, right, from the camera, two Rec 709 low contrast, medium contrast, high contrast, teal and orange look two-tone look, and Alexa look-alike. That's what's included in the pack. It's cost a dollar if you're getting it from Gumroad. If you're following me on social media, I'm gonna do my best to include a coupon code that will allow you to get it for free. That means following me on YouTube, I'll post it on the community tab, follow me on Twitter, I'm gonna tweet about it, follow me on Instagram, I'm gonna either put up an Instagram story or an Instagram post with the coupon code once I get that sorted. If there's enough interest, I will put together a full-blown pro pack that will allow you to match the EOS R to a RED, to a 1DX Mark II, to a C300 Mark II, or a C200, or the XC15, which happens to be my favorite top-down camera. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. Please give me some feedback. Again, just to be clear, treat this as experimental, right? So keep your expectations in check, but I look forward to the feedback in the comments. And until next time, catch you guys later.